Hey everyone, and welcome to another YouTube video. Today, I'm talking to WGA screenwriter Brooks Elms. What's going on, Brooks? Hey man, uh, good to be here. For sure. So today, uh, I wanted to bring Brooks on and talk a little bit about his experience in the film industry and talk about him breaking in because I think that is something that a lot of people are interested in. And so, Brooks, I wanted to start off and ask you about the process of selling your first screenplay. Uh, my first screenplay I sold um, uh, because I, I well I, I I went to NYU Film School and I, I uh, and there was a guy I went to film school with and he um, had had a bunch of produced credits and I was meeting with him to see if he wanted to be wanted to produce this other uh, project so I I'd written direct and produced several independent feature films that's kind of like the first phase of my career and I did okay uh, with those things um, sort of. You know, played festivals, played around the world, but didn't quite really hit out to that sort of more professional level, sort of like a solid amateur level work. Um, and I had this new one that I felt like could go to the next level. And I spoke to this producer uh, who's a friend of mine and he was like, look, this is really good. But like, let's, you know, my contacts are different. See, if, can you write me like a genre movie? And I was like, man, I, you know, I can't, you know, I, I don't write genre movies. I write these personal dramas. I can't, you know, uh, but then I thought about it. I was like, no, no, this is an opportunity, right? So let me, let me sort of be humble and go, okay, what can I do that I really love with personal drama that, that also hits the beats of, uh, of a, this was a, it was a sci-fi thriller idea. Um, and then that really was what was able to, me to come together, right? Because I was good at this one thing, but I didn't quite, couldn't quite get to the next level. He gave me this opportunity, so I was okay, great. So I did it. And originally, we were gonna. I brought in this one writing partner who I do a lot of stuff with, and originally we were gonna direct it ourselves for I don't know two million, three million. But he was so happy with the way the script came out, he was like, "Look, I think I can get this set up around town." And I was like, "Great, you know." So um, he uh, he walked us into UTA. They loved it. Uh, they went out with it, and then um, yeah, eventually got picked up by Gold Circle. Gotcha. That's fantastic. Talk to me a little bit about right before that. You're talking about you were making these uh, independent productions. Talk a little bit about that process. Yeah. So uh, at NYU Film School, um, well, before NYU Film School, I made movies with my friends and they were all like goofy comedies. <laughs> Most of them. I would dress up in ridiculous costumes and, and they were lots and lots of fun. And I had my sense of film grammar down before I even, as like a writer director, before I even got to NYU. I'd made like 50 short film experiments. And then um, got to NYU and I started realizing that there's this whole thing about like film literacy, like, um, you know, uh, what this director did, what that director, and then also, you know, and why they did it and blah, blah, blah. So that deepened my sort of voice and I started doing more personal stuff. And then I won a a screenplay award for my senior thesis film because it was a pretty good personal grounded drama. Um, so that was kind of, um, so I felt like, okay, I'm doing pretty well here. And then I went and I made a feature right out of NYU, like that summer that I left. Um, and it was, uh, it was this, you know, grounded drama about, based on like my experiences playing soccer at NYU. Um, we were this kind of perfectly mediocre soccer team, not terrible, but not great. <laughs> and it was kind of like a hangout movie in college, sort of like Days of Confused or something in, in, in college. So it was good for what it was, but it was kind of like, you know, graduate film school level. Probably, you know, I was 22 and it was, it was, it was just, I was still learning, you know, but it was, there were some aspects of it that were all right. So, um, so uh, I had that and then I tried to make another feature after that. And um, at that, that point I was broke. I had no, I had no money. And I, I, and we, How did you fund that first feature? Uh, I had some money. I had some I basically fam family money. It was sixty five thousand bucks, and um, yeah, my father had died when I was seventeen, so I had a little bit of money to kind of play with, and uh, and I was happy to spend it. <laughs> it was great. Um, it was so much fun, and uh, and so yeah. So and then, but then I was out of money. So then, um, so I was like, so we came up with this found footage idea, and this was before Blair Witch. This was like uh, mid nineties, and um, and it was. There are aspects of it that were good, but the problem is that it wasn't it wasn't a cohesive concept, and I knew really nothing about structure. NYU is really like a writer director type program, and I you know I went to Robert McKee's seminar and I studied all sorts of stuff, but I really didn't have a comprehensive system about structure, so I kind of just swung it, and that project um, 
uh, was aptly titled Disaster Video. <laughs> we never even really finished it um, because I, I knew that I wanted it to be great and, and, and it wasn't, you know, and, and ultimately because mm. I didn't really know enough about structure. Um, mm. And then I took a couple years off from the business and then I came back, moved out to LA, made another independent feature, which again was, it was okay. It was this personal drama um, that was set in this world of this um, very radical educational system where the kids could be do exactly what they wanted all day long. Uh, and it was kind of this thematic exploration of authority in, in a lot of different ways. And it was, it was okay, but it was really obscure. People, I loved it and, uh, for what it was. And then, and then that was a time where I was like, okay, I got to start doing something that's a little more broad. And, um, and, when I, and I wrote this other one that was a coming-of-age story set in my hometown of the Hamptons because I grew up as a, as a local in the Hamptons. So people know the, the fancy side of the Hamptons and the mansions and the celebrities – so I, I, I wrote uh, a cross conf, conf, I co-wrote a uh, uh, class conflict love story set there. So it was personal but broader, and that was the one that I brought to my friend. I was like, dude, you know, produce this. And he was like, look, it's great, but, you know, g- give me a genre movie, <laughs> like a straight-up mm-hmm. genre mm-hmm. movie. So sci-fi right. thriller was, was, was better. And then, but that was really the biggest turning point in my career. It was like, how do I take what I love and I already do well, but just take it to the next level? Um, mm. and, and it required some humility because I, I walked away from that meeting going, ah, well, he doesn't want to produce it, you know, and there was this other producer that was going to be sort of a line producer for that other project. He was like, dude, what are you doing? No, he's basically trying to help you out. You, you got to get out of your own way. And I was like, oh, right. Okay. Right. And it was great. And you know, it totally changed my career. Wow. That's crazy. So it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you were doing all of this work outside of the industry on your own, creating these projects. And that gave you the ability to, you know, get enough credibility with these people that could actually make you, you know, move you to that next level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so here's the thing. People always talk about like access in Hollywood, you know, like, oh, you know, Hollywood's a closed door and all these gays and stuff like that. But it's, it really isn't. I mean, Hollywood loves discovering new people. They love it. I mean, the, if you... <laughs> If you have a great script, Hollywood is looking for you. The, what's almost certain is it takes time to have a really good script. It takes a lot, a lot of time, a lot of practice. So, um, uh, so, and then once you, yeah. And so, um, so the guy that ended up helping me out and had all these credits, I mean, you know, technically I went to NYU with him. So you could say, oh, well, you guys were NYU buddies and blah, blah, blah. But I went to a lot of but there's a lot of people I went to NYU with, um, and um, you know, some were friends. I'm friends with some. I'm not, you know. Um, and so um, there's, and literally, there's zero people that I went to NYU with that would just be like, I could go, hey, it's Brooks from NYU, and they'd be like, okay, direct my next thing or write this. They don't, no one cares. They don't, mm-hmm. I mean, the knowing somebody from the same school for whatever reason can open the door this much, and then you got to step mm-hmm. through it. It's like you know, if you're Brad Pitt's brother. Um, Okay, you know, I don't even know if it has a brother, but like hypothetically, if some movie star has a brother and um, uh, that'll open the door, but if you don't have the goods, it, it, it won't matter. So for this mm. guy, he, the door was open because, you know, we liked each other in film school and we were friends. Um, and, uh, and, and that was enough for, me, for him to go. He was in a place where he thought, oh, I like Brooks. He's interesting. Um, you know, I can't do this thing for him. I would like to work with him, but can he do something that so you know can he connect these dots and uh and i was able to do it gotcha so throughout that process of selling your first screenplay what sort of things did you learn that you used further on when you were selling things later on in your career that's that's a great so the biggest takeaway from that experience one was that it took a long time you know that it was Mm. so we and in fact we actually got two bites at the apple we went out with that script just as a naked spec and uh, everybody in the town passed. And I had, I had a great uh, uh, agent at UTA at the time. He was a partner. So um, he sent it out. Everybody passes. So I go, okay, well, then we'll go back to making it ourselves. That was the idea we were going to do anyway, right? Um, and then that one producer met this other producer who was like, I love this idea. I want to get involved. He got involved. We did a draft for him. We brought in a, a, a different director who was already on the studio list, did a draft for him, then went back out to the town. So it was basically the same script, but, you know, slightly different in, in some ways. Um, that goes out to the town. Then this company uh, says, we love it, um, but <clears throat> we love the, this part of it. We don't love the ending. 
can you guys pitch us a new ending? So, all right, we circled up. We're like, okay, how about this as an ending? They were like, oh, you know, and that took probably two meetings. And then it was like, okay, yeah, this is good. We love the script. We love the character. We go, let's do it. So then it takes five months from that point to even just for the contracts to settle. You mm-hmm. know, and I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> and then the contracts settle. Um, and then we're like, okay, let's get into it. And then it was probably, you know, we did it. We did a treatment for the new version. Um, and we banged it out in probably two weeks, three weeks, hand it to them. Two months later, they get back to us with notes. <laughs> oh, man, you know? So then, okay, fine. We Oh, good notes. We love them. Let's go. Boom, 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 boom. We bang out these notes in two weeks. Two months, they get back to us with notes. I mean, just, you know, so um, it just took a while, you know? And mm-hmm. it was a it was a big people, that a big group at that point. So it was me and my writing partner, um, one, two producers and the director and their development director and the big guy at the production company. So that's a big group of people. And they're all smart people, really good to work with. Um, but it's just a lot of different opinions. So you have to, really your diplomacy game is so important when you get to those higher, higher levels. You can't, you, you can't be obnoxious. Well, look, you can do whatever you want. And, um, but like your chances of sustaining your career and keeping working is, is better when you're just fun to work with. You're, you're reasonable. You can not roll. You don't, they don't want you to roll over. Cause that was something I probably even did on that first job a little bit too much. Anyway, I was sort of, I was so eager to, to be a team player and get along. There was probably ways I could have, I mean, I was, you know, I, I did voice my opinion, but there was probably ways I could have pushed back that I would certainly could do it now more gracefully and skillfully. And we probably could have gotten to a deeper place and had uh, an even better sort of product. But, um, but I was just kind of like, okay, I got the note. I'll try. I was I'm happy to try anything, you know? So um, that's a big takeaway is, is on the other, on the other side, you, 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 you want to fight for your, you want to, f- it's always in service to the audience. How, how can we best serve the audience? Best idea wins and then have really good um, productive conversations around how to serve the audience and um yeah and that and it takes it, it, it can take some time to, to get good mm-hmm. at that um i mean sure. some people will be a little too stubborn some people were too too loose you want to be right in the middle and then just be in service but it was so that was it the timing it took a lot took a lot of time um being more skillful and how to you know sort of uh have, have fight for fight for my vision um and uh, those are the probably the two main takeaways gotcha so what do you think is the most important thing that new screenwriters need to know as they are trying to sell their first screenplay? Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, the, so the game in the beginning stages are, is to get your voice down in a way that you love and you feel like this is really powerful. And then you have your own sort of development circles, peers, friends, uh, analysts, anybody who, who's been there who can give you really good notes to crank it up and crank it up and crank it up so that you feel like, man, this is, you know, and sometimes that takes 5, 10, 20 drafts. You just have to be really patient um, to sort of, especially in the early phases, because you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes it just takes some time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, and then once you have it, then the game is, okay, I love this thing. I'm getting really good feedback from my inner development circle. Um, who in town might be interested in this? And so what I generally suggest to people is these, there's two lists of sort of favorite colleagues that you'd like to work with. One are the colleagues that have, that have been producers um, uh, or showrunners who's working in TV uh, with sort of that, that have been behind your favorite material of all time. Um, so that's one list. And then there's a list of people who are involved with um, – material that's adjacent to this this genre that you're working in right now right so there's two different lists and then those, those are your, sort of your target lists um and and you know that they belong in your list or not um and if you're looking for representation it's the same thing people who are sort of representing maybe these people or other people that you like so you don't put somebody on your list unless they've they've had credits or have you've heard something about them where they sound like you, you're a kindred spirit um, or else you're just wasting their time. Sometimes you don't know. You kind of seem like it. But like, you know, the whole some 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 writers will like shotgun their stuff all over town. And it's just it's you're just wasting your time and their time and, and mm. adding to noise. You want to be very specific and feel like you have a real reason to talk to these people. And then um, and then you try it. You just try talking. You. you can connect to people on Twitter. You can connect to people, um, you know, uh, going directly to email is a little tricky. It's better if you can 
it, the, it's, it's, social media is great. Or if you like, if you can look at an article like such and such, it was on a panel at South by Southwest or wherever, and you go, oh, and you read it, you read, you read the interview, and then you approach them ideally through social media because it's sort of safe and you just have conversations you just try to get into a genuine conversation with no agenda other than hey this would be a cool uh, conversation to have with a kindred spirit and if they're a kindred spirit and if you can have a good conversation with them that door opens and that one now once the doors open if you guys have a genuine even if it's a joke or a laugh or or it could even be a, a common like let's say the person produced a movie that you love um, and they happen to be into the same charity that you're into, or whatever. You you, you ready? To, you know you uh, you know connect with them on social media about the charity or whatever. So you just kind of it's open a little bit, and then maybe uh, you know. And again, it doesn't have to be now. And no one person is going to make or break your career. So just have these conversations, and then whatever you know. A month later, maybe you have a script that's ready, and you have a log line. But when you reach out to them. Make it an easy ask, something really simple. Don't be like, hey, will you read my screenplay? Or, hey, will you sign me as a client? Oh my God, no, it's terrible. It's terrible. So you you just ease it back. You're just having a conversation. These pe- Trust me, these people, it's, it's not this, people think of Hollywood as this fortress and they're keeping everybody out. It's not, it's a dinner party. And you can, if you approach somebody in a dinner party the right way, you're gonna get into a conversation with them. And if they're a genuine kindred spirit and you're ready, then it's gonna happen. It's not, it's not a, it, it really is it, 90% of the, of the, of the rub about people going, oh, I can't get an agent or I can't get a producer or whatever is because the, the, the material is probably just not ready. It, mm. it, they, they, they underestimate how long it really takes to, but, but they, they, they really shouldn't if you think about it, because it's a game where they're, they're competing against Tarantino and Aaron Sworkin and everybody. They're, they're competing against the legends. So, um, you know, and then for every, every writer like that that we can name, there's literally 15,000 people in the WGA, you mm-hmm. know. And even to get into the WGA, your, your odds are better of making a, a Major League Baseball team than getting into the WGA. That's how elite it is. And then there's, and there's 15,000 people you've never heard of that are in the WGA actively trying to sell scripts right now. And you've got to beat them as a new guy. So this competition is stacked upon stacked upon stacked, and they're still making 550 TV series every year. They're they're making you know hundreds of movies, um, and that's just pretty much in the established system plus thousands of other independent films. So there's opportunity, um, and you're not directly competing against those 15,000 people in the WGA, but you know it, there's pockets of competition, and you get to pick which hill you want to fight on. Mm. Yeah. See, that makes a lot of sense because it seems that what you're really harping on is that people are so focused on trying to get an agent or they're trying to sell, or they're trying to do this so quickly and they're not realizing the amount of time it takes to actually be a good writer and actually put in the work of writing screenplays and defining what your voice is and defining what your vision is and what you have to say. And that definitely takes time. And I, that, that makes so much sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, I get a lot of people hitting me up on Twitter and they're going, oh, you know, you know, I, you know, I want to, I want to get an agent. I want to get a producer. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So have you been submitting your, your script to like contests and stuff like that? Oh, no, not really. I haven't. I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting because that's the equivalent of being like, hey, I'm a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, high school baseball player. I want to try out for the Yankees. Like, maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe you can make the Yankees. Uh, or maybe, you know, why don't you try going for a minor league team first and then like leading the league in home runs and then go to the majors, you know? I mean, there's just, there's just levels. So they, and, you know, and, and I get it. And, you know, people are, people see movies. The, 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 what happens is, People see movies and shows. They're like, "Man, this is terrible. <laughs> I hate this thing. This thing looks like a piece of garbage. I could, I could do better, right?" And that's a good impulse, and if, and if it helps. But um, I, I, there's just a common misunderstanding about um, how 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 long it takes to really sort of get get that voice dialed in. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So my final question for you is: If you could go back to the very beginning of your career as a writer, what would you change? What would you do differently? It's a great question, and and I absolutely would have not made a feature at age twenty two. Um, I would have made more shorts and made sure because look, there's lots of people who have broken into Hollywood just because they have a hot short. 
the short is. Um, in fact, the guy that we attached to the first script that I sold, this is actually really instructive. So um, again, we were going to, you know, so we wrote the script, we were going to make it ourselves, but he said, no, let's get it set up. So this producers got involved. They're like, okay, we're going to take this thing out. Let's attach a director. And I'm like, Hello, me. How about me? I, I co-wrote it. I, I've written, I've made already made two features. And instead, they attached a guy who'd only made a short film. So why would they attach a guy who's only made a short film as opposed to an independent filmmaker who co-wrote it? Um, and, the, and, and, the, and it was because he was on the studio list and I was not. He, mm. that short film that he made was, was decent. And, um, and, it was picked up by Paramount for a development deal that puts him on the studio list. He's approved. I am not because I'm some independent filmmaker that they've never heard of. That's it. I mean, look, I, you know, we control the rights and material. We could have fought for it or whatever, but like, you know, I was pissed off for about a day. I was, cause I was like, they're like, we're going to attach a director. I'm like, Oh, David Fincher, this person, you know, I'm like, okay, this guy. I was like, wait a minute. I, what? That guy hasn't even made a feature. I'm like, How, that guy instead of me. So I was completely insulted and embarrassed and pissed off for about a day. And then I was like, oh, yeah, well, look, that's, that's the game, you know? Um, mm. And, and uh, you know, I'm a team player. I'm a businessman. Um, if that's better for the team, then great. Um, but so what I would have done was, if I was to go back in time, at 22, I would have said, look, dude, Brooks, you're really good at this sort of thing. Do that at the next level, at the next level. Get even better, right? Because, for example, the... the uh, one scene from that feature, um, I had it up on YouTube until they took it down. Um, 1.1 million views on that on that scene. So wow. it was a good it was a good effing scene, right? And it was 5,000 views a day for a, for a while. Um, it was the sex scene, um, but it wasn't like porn. It just it was just kind of like a saucy sex scene, you know. Um, but literally, and it was for like for four years, over four years, 1.1 million views. So um, I would have been. If, I, it would have been smarter for me to craft like something around that sort of scene or that sort of thing, blow up at the at the film festival circuit, do, do you know, and then um, and then expand out because you know I was really good. I was a really good amateur, but I wasn't good enough to really hold somebody's attention for ninety minutes. I could I could mm. I could do a great job in five minutes, but not ninety. And so um, I would have, as a writer director, started shorter. And then I probably would have wrote features as a screenwriter to really hone my ability to hold attention for 90 minutes. Gotcha. That makes a ton of sense. Well, Brooks, it's been fantastic listening to you talk about your insights and getting into the industry and, you know, actually building up to becoming that professional writer. And now, you know, clearly you're in the WGA or successful writer now, and that's fantastic. I wanted to ask you if you have anything to plug, you know, for people to find you, look at more about what you're doing. Uh, where should they find you online? Thanks. Yeah, uh, they can check me out on Twitter. That's the best part. I'm most active there um, and a lot, a lot of tweets and a lot of good stuff there. And uh, yeah, and then there's I'm, I'm uh, rewriting uh, actually an Oscar winning screenwriter right now, which is really fun. And I'm uh, and there's there's something I sold this year that I think will be produced because the stuff I've produced with those independent films I made before, the stuff that I've sold uh that was the other thing too. Is that the the first one I sold came really close to getting produced, but didn't. So, mm. so things are different if that happens. So, um, uh, but I think this next one that I produced, um, there's some really good people involved, and they're really excited about. It, so I think that one's going to go. But fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah, but I I love it. I love everything about it, and I love helping writers too. So yeah, come on For by. Sure. Good to see you at Twitter. Absolutely. Follow Brooks on Twitter. I'll have it linked in the description below. It's great talking with you today, Brooks. Thanks, Tyler. You too, man. I really appreciate it. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that interview with WGA screenwriter Brooks Elms. If you want to follow him on Twitter, links for that are in the description below. And if you are the writer that we talked about, if you're the writer that is looking to sell that first screenplay, and if you're the writer that is looking to get the quality of their screenplays to that sell ready level, then I want to talk to you about high level screenwriting, which is a program that myself and WGA screenwriter Dominic Morgan have started, where we take writer scripts and get them to that sell ready level, as well as give them guidance on actually navigating the film industry. If that sounds like something that you would be interested in, then click the link below to schedule a call with me and we'll talk about whether or not you're a good fit and go from there. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.